This conference will now be recorded. Thanks everyone for joining the uh, webinar today. Uh, today's LOG event sponsored by Microfocus and Vivid New England Area Local User Group. Um, myself and Mugit are the uh, Vivid leaders for New England chapter. Uh, Mugit was unable to join today. Uh, I'll be acting as a moderator for today's event. Uh, I do have extensive experience on the Microsoft Focus tools as well as like you know various other middleware tools. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Mason today uh, from uh, Microfocus, uh, who's going to give uh, the demo. Mason has spent almost past eight years with the microfocus in the application uh, delivery space. Uh, he has interacted with hundreds of clients over the years across the US, giving him a unique understanding of challenges that organizations face applications uh, delivery today. Mason has focused on core components of microfocus ADM solution. Lifecycle management, performance engineering, functional testing, which includes practice like AI, mobile, and DevOps. So we appreciate you joining us today and hope that you're all safe and healthy. You know. Thanks, Ramesh. This event, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Rohan. So these events are normally face-to-face, -face, but due to the pandemic situation, we have to hold virtually. Uh, in this way, we have to be in, invite companies all over the New England area, even Pennsylvania, so welcome. Today's live sessions will be recorded and posted to all the Vivid members. If you are not Vivid member, please join us. Uh, it's free to join on the online uh, web portal. Uh, then have access to all the recording as well as the previous uh, webinars. On-demand recording, uh, slide decks and questions and answers will be posted on the web, uh, Vivid website under the uh, LUG group page. You will find this by going to the group drop-down list, uh, search for the appropriate group, like for example, New England uh, chapter group, uh, we'll send you the link via email once everything is posted as well. When you're not asking the questions, please mute yourself on the microphone. Uh, please enter your audio pin if you're joined via phone in order to link your phone call with GoToMeeting control panel. This allows you to mute and unmute yourself using audio button rather than using your telephone keypad. It also ensures that other participants will be able to see when you are speaking. Lastly, we will be sharing the way to uh, remedy your lunch coupon at the end of the session. To submit any questions, please click on the uh, dialog button on the uh, upper right corner of the screen, type your questions. Or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask questions yourself uh, if required, you can you know enable the webcam, and this will help us to you know uh, interact uh, each other. So for those who are not joining, uh, uh, I mean those who are joining today are not a Vivit member. I wanted to share with your with our community is all about Vivit is independent non-profit or service organization that represents broad microfocus community globally. It's also endorsed uh, Microfocus Software as a group. Vivit mission is to serve Microfocus community through uh, advocacy, community, and education. For almost two decades, Vivit has been unbiased, trusted, field-tested user community for thousands of HP and more recently HP software customers. Through the acquisition of our scope has been expanded from our original focus on OpenView to include Microfocus micro, uh, Mercury Interactive freshwater and uh, vertical customers. Developers and partners from around the world and from all the areas of business and industries. With the merger of HP, software and microfocus businesses. Once again, we are here to help our members attain the maximum benefits of, from their investment in microfocus uh, products. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mason uh, for the demo. Thanks, Ramesh. 
So to start, yes, you are seeing you are seeing the right thing. Uh, and what we what we have here uh, on my my slide, I'd like a volunteer if somebody wants to chime in and tell me what do you see here. Three animals not practicing social distancing civic responsibilities well <laughs> oh good good so cl close <laughs> so i'd say it's three right the what we see here potentially is three dogs uh, but I i'm going to help you categorize, categorize those dogs a little bit in that we see two dogs and one dog that is at least in part being a socially responsible dog uh, so we're going to come back to this in later on in the presentation. But uh, based on what we've seen here is that I gave you uh, a, the context, the environment in which to make a decision. I asked you to make a decision and then I helped you categorize that decision uh, after I asked you. Uh, so we'll come back to that here in a moment. But again, I'm Mason Henry. I'm an ADM solution architect with MicroFocus. Uh, I've been with HP, HP, and now MicroFocus for going on nine years now, uh, all within the application delivery management space. Uh, and I'm happy to be here to talk with you all today and confident that uh, we're going to be able to together learn about how the artificial intelligence capabilities that have been infused into UFT1 uh, and eventually uh, other parts of the, the functional testing portfolio for MicroFocus uh, can help make your testing smarter. Um, but, you know, let's sort of level set with the question of what is AI? Um, so AI can have a lot of different definitions, but basically AI is a way to train computers to make intelligent decisions based on past data. Um, so we have the ability to have what's called intelligent agents that have sensors and actuators, which uh, in the simplest form is basically how they receive data and then how they make decisions based on that data. And there's a number of different applications that are of this type of technology. Uh, but when we break it down to, if, if there's one sentence that I could say about, uh, about AI is that it is uncertainty management. So what to do when you don't know what to do. Um, and as far as applications of that type of technology is, is endless. So whether that be from the medical field, uh, recognizing a stopping car and self-driving vehicles, automated responders from a customer support standpoint, or even with uh, you know financial examples of the stock market. So I could have an intelligent agent that uh, is a financial application that has uh, sensors that take in data about the stock market. That can be stock prices, that can be news uh, within, uh, within the media that is taking into account. Uh, and then based on that data, they can have actuators or make decisions, in this case trades, based on that information that they're taking in. So there's an endless amount of applications for AI technology in the marketplace today across all verticals. Um, but specifically, obviously, here today, we want to talk about how and why AI can help in software test automation. So when we look at the, the full spectrum of what we see as far as different personas and different tools that are out there in the market today, that ranges you know, from this shift left concept of testing earlier with, uh, with the developer or dev tester, uh, all the way to the right, which is really those subject matter experts, those domain experts, from the business that understand the full business process, that understand how the the application should be functioning and designed, uh, but don't necessarily have the technical skill set to write code to be able to automate things. And then there's that centralized QA automation engineer or quality engineer with, that uh, has skill sets from both sides as well. But what we see from a challenge standpoint is one uh, primary is that uh, the, the fast paced releases. So with uh, you know, adoption of things like Agile and DevOps uh, across the marketplace is that there's much, much, much more frequent application changes. Even if those changes are small, there's still much more frequent changes. I mean, I think back to the MicroFocus portfolio several years ago where we had products that we would have a release, you know, twice a year at best, once a year, maybe even once every 18 to 24 months. Uh, that's completely changed now in that we have solutions that are uh, you know, able to release nightly. Uh, we sort of package those things up in some of those solutions, but uh, so even in effect uh, you know, on a pre-sales role, not just 
the software delivery team. So frequent application changes, which cause fast paced releases, uh, causes a challenge from an automation standpoint in being able to keep up. Uh, then from an automation coverage standpoint, uh, obviously that gets, that's gonna mean low automation rates, but that's also contributed to by the skill set barrier that it takes to that that exists in order for different users to be able to create that automation. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, especially when we look at a lot of the the shift left type focus, is that those are highly technical tools. I mean, you're writing Java and JavaScript code uh, in order to create that automation, and even with uh, you know things like uh, UFT one that give you different capabilities to um, have like keyword driven view and things. There's you know, there's still code on the back end. Um, so there's still that skill set barrier for the types of personas that can contribute to automation. So that's definitely a, a barrier and a challenge that we see in the market today. And then finally, well, probably the biggest one is high maintenance. Uh, being able to maintain all of these automation assets is extremely time consuming and extremely costly for organizations to be able to do. Because obviously when there's an application change, even if it's just one something minor, like a, a, an application's object moves from one area on the page to another, this can break automation and be a significant effort to be able to overcome, especially when we're having these constant and frequent application changes and releases. And I wanna take a, a second to, to look at an example from today's reality that is uh, aligning to those same challenges. Uh, so what we see today and what we're going to walk through today with some of our examples is a use case that we have for automating a business process of buying an item in an e-commerce application. So uh, an e-commerce application, it's called Advantage Online Shopping. And basically, I have the ability to purchase things like laptops and headphones and tablets on both a Android platform, an iOS platform, as well as mobile web. So we have an Android native app, an iOS native app, and it's available on mobile web. Uh, the challenge today, obviously, with existing capabilities uh, within you know, different automation tools is that more than likely you're going to have to create three scripts in order to automate the same flow across each one of these platforms, one for Android native, uh, iOS native, and mobile web. So that introduces automatically a time to market challenge in that we're going to have to create three scripts and not only create three scripts, but maintain those three scripts just for this one process, just for this one flow through the application. Um, so obviously any changes can break that automated script, which brings into to argument the, the ROI of the automation to begin with. So this is, this is the example that we're gonna walk through today. So how that's done today, uh, we're gonna see example of that using properties-based object identification methods within UFT1 connecting to a mobile device. So as you can see here, I'll start the video. I can run my test that selects the device uh, and logs into the application. Um, easy peasy, we identify things like the, the profile label, the username mobile edit field, the password mobile edit field, and the login button. And uh, we can either identify those by descriptive programming, or in this case, we're putting those things into the object repository. But let's introduce a small change into the application. So what we can see here is that before, uh, the shopping cart and the hamburger menu. Now, after we introduce a change to the application, we see that the hamburger menu and the shopping cart have switched locations. So let's see how our test responds to that change. In this case, it's, it's, it's obviously going to fail because those object properties have changed uh, as far as how we've identified that object. So we can see here that we're actually gonna get a failure that, hey, it says, I can't find this um, because, because we clicked the wrong button. And f for most of you, I would assume uh, you, you understand even better than I do why this is happening because the object identification is based on those physical properties of the objects and edit fields and such within the, the application so that changes in the application uh, the, of the implementation, they can impact those underlying object properties and cause your automation to break. So the question that, that I wanna propose here is what if we could automate this business process 
as a human might see it, as you or I might see it, because obviously there would be no problem for me to go throughout that process of logging in and adding something into the cart just because the shopping cart and the menu selector changed locations. I would still be able to identify those things and select those things. So we should be able to train a computer to be able to do that as well. So some of the, the major research areas in AI uh, we see here, uh, obviously these range from things like reasoning and problem solving, which is the foundation of artificial intelligence, all the way until things like general intelligence, which is our uh, our Terminator type scenario <laughs> per se. Uh, but really from a micro focus functional testing standpoint, we have a, a high level of focus on three core areas within the AI capabilities and research areas. And the first one being perception. So the, the implementation of this is really computer vision. So being able to recognize uh, both from a user experience and a UI standpoint objects on a screen. Uh, whether that screen be a mobile device or a web application, what, what have you. Uh, then the next piece is machine and deep learning, which that comes in sort of two different flavors, one unsupervised learning and supervised learning. So in the unsupervised learning scenario, this brings in the concept of identifying risk and then being able to make decisions based on that risk. So if you remember from the beginning, I said, you know, a, a good, simple definition of, of AI is uncertainty management, what to do when you don't know what to do. Uh, but there's also supervised learning as well. So UI element classification, this is helping us train the application uh, or the AI engine to be able to be able to build on its past knowledge. So giving it classification in order to help it make the decision as we train it to be smarter. So I told you I would come back to this example, uh, and this was an example to talking about training. So I asked you the question of what do you see here? Uh, I helped you along in that uh, I said, you know, th the correct answer is three dogs, but now I'm going to help you classify that a little bit more specifically in that I see two dogs and a socially responsible dog. So based on that, what do you see here? Take a volunteer. I'll vol volunteer myself. <laughs> it's a, a cat, a cat, and a socially responsible cat. Uh, so there, there was magic that happened there. It's very simple to us, but there, were, there was some magic that happened there, that we were able to see a picture, we were able to identify it, and then we were able to classify that and give it the right name based on the classification that I helped you along with. Um, that's because our human brains have neural networks, and we have the ability to learn and train our neural network to be able to make decisions and do its job on a daily basis, like being able to distinguish between different images on a screen. Which brings the question of how are those things created? Um, so what you're seeing here, this is my uh, a picture of my son Wells when he was a newborn. Uh, whenever he was born, he did not have the ability, clearly in this state, to be able to distinguish between a cat and a dog. He had no idea of the concept of what a dog or a cat was, much less be able to tell the difference between a, a cat and a dog. But now that he's a little over a year old, uh, he has the ability to do this task, right? When we uh, read him a book and we go through the pages of his animal book and the picture of the dog comes up, he says, dog. And when we turn the page and there's a picture of a cat, he says meow. So he understands the difference between a cat and a dog. And how he was able to do that is that his mom and dad, us, right? In other words, his supervisors were able to teach him by example until that his brain was equipped with a neural network to be able to do this task on his own. So one more example. And if, if I could please have a volunteer to tell me, what do you see here? Three login pages. Three login pages, exactly. So if we were to, if I were to ask you to automate this with an automated testing solution, you're going to have three different scripts. Maybe something is similar between this one and this one, but still probably not. Right? It looks like this is in a web browser, and this is probably a, you know, a client 
on the on a Windows machine. But the point is that you have no problem identifying that these are all login screens, whether it says username or email address or password or login or sign in, you have the ability to tell that these are all login pages. Uh, so we should be able to have the ability to train computers to be able to do that, uh, same as our human brain does. Finally, I want to talk about the third uh, core major research area that we have a uh, focus on within the MicroFocus functional testing capabilities, and that is natural language processing and how that equates or plays itself out from a functional testing standpoint is within test case design. Uh, so I'll take us through an example here of that as well. So we have a simple task and that simple task, or we could call it a test case, is to search for a dog in Google. So obviously that from a plain spoken language standpoint, that's very easy, right? Hey, search for a dog in Google. I know how to go and do that. But if we were to teach a automated testing solution to be able to do that, there's a number of different steps, right? So the first step is I need to launch a browser. I need to navigate to google.com and I'd probably need to specify which browser I want to launch as well, as well as then find the search edit field, type in the word dog and click on the search button and then explore the results and do some sort of validation that we did in fact find that there were images of dogs that appeared uh, within our results. But if there's the option to be able to, you know, quote unquote, talk to our testing tool in the same way, uh, we can simplify that those steps in building out or automating that test case, as well as being able to have the ability to remove the technical skill barrier to be able to do that. So now I want to, to transition into talking about how uh, we are effectively doing these things within the functional testing por for po portfolio from MicroFocus, uh, which we've initially launched some of these things and infused this AI capability into our UFT1 solution. So I'll come back to the example from today's reality. As you recall, we have the the use case for automating a business process in our Advantage Online Shopping app. And that app is available on Android, iOS, and as mobile web. And right today, the challenges that we talked to are, talked through is that we have, have to create three scripts to be able to automate the same flow. So that's gonna introduce time to market challenges. And then anytime anything changes, as we saw in the, the example as well, that, that's gonna break our automated test. So we have to deal with that, that high level of maintenance um, thus bringing into question, do we even, are we even getting the return on investment that we expected from automating this process? Um, so we're going to do this in two different ways and talk about this in two different ways that align towards uh, the, the persona first of a, you know, of a QA individual or you know, quality engineer, as well as that, that persona from the business or that subject matter expert. So from, from a quality engineering standpoint, uh, really what we're looking at from a value standpoint is that we're able to reduce that test time creation, crest creation time, because we're only having to create one script across all of those platforms. Uh, then we can reduce that test maintenance all on top of that, because again, it's only one script, but also by use, utilizing what we call the AI utility within UFT1, we're gonna be able to identify objects with the neural network instead of by those uh, traditional properties-based object identification methods so that when something changes or moves around on the page, our AI engine is able to overcome those, those changes. And then obviously that's gonna be lead to more stable scripts. Uh, so giving flexibility in how we use that AI utility and traditional automation methods within the same script. So if there is for some reason, something our neural network hasn't learned yet, uh, within the same script, I can still use that the properties-based identification methods in order to identify objects and text and such. So one thing that you'll see is different here is that uh, this is not using properties-based message. This is using the AI utility uh, within UFT1. So I, what this video doesn't show, which I wish it did, is that the object repository is empty. There are no objects within the object repository because we're using our neural network to identify those things. As well as if you would have seen at the bottom, uh, we're gonna execute this test across three different platforms. Uh, in this case, uh, we're starting with Android 
and doing a search, logging in and doing a search for a laptop. Next, uh, it will do the same process on an iOS device. Uh, and then there's gonna be one significant change that happens across uh, both of those platforms that the AI utility that has been infused into UFT1 is able to overcome. So as you can see here, uh, we're executing this across the iOS device now. So same script uh, running on Android and now running on iOS to be able to log in, do a search for a laptop and add it to the cart, the shopping cart. So now that that is successful, we can look at the results and talk about that very important change that we were able to overcome, not just from a platform standpoint, one script across those, but as you can see here on the Android, the shopping cart and the hamburger menu were on opposite sides from how the iOS app was deployed to the device, yet our script was able to execute successfully. So the next uh, use case really is focused on that, that business analyst or subject matter expert, domain expert, that doesn't necessarily have the technical skill set that it takes to be able to build automated test assets, but they have the ability to really understand the full business process and understand how it should function for an end user. So what that leads us to is giving them the ability to create more accurate and complete tests because of their subject matter expertise uh, by, by allowing them to create automation assets. We're, we're helping remove that skill set barrier to testing, which was one of those challenges that we see related to automation coverage, uh, as well as we're able to, to kick up that automation ROI because we simply have more people, more personas that are able to create those automation assets as well. So what we're gonna be looking at here is uh, a new tool that has been introduced within, that comes with UFT1, and this is called Codeless. So it's our Codeless testing utility. Uh, so this is in tech preview today, um, but what we're gonna walk through is how we're gonna take into context those natural language processing capabilities that we talked about, uh, that core research area within AI, and apply it to functional testing. So what you see here is the UI for our Codeless testing solution. As I play this, we're going to add an environment. So an, add in, an environment in this case is just a device, a mobile device, and an application under test. So we're going to continue with the same process, the same uh, use case that we had of being able to automate that one scenario across multiple platforms. So I can do this first by creating it on an iOS device. So using the inspection tool, I'm able to identify, using the neural network, all the different objects that are visible on the screen. So in this case, you see a search, the magnifying glass, a shopping cart, a hamburger menu. Uh, if we want to add in those individual objects that are on the device as well, we could do that manually or by you know doing the inspection and double clicking or dragging and dropping those objects into our script. Uh, so for instance, we can also input the values into things that are you know per perhaps edit fields like a username and a password and be able to apply those as steps in our test. Um, not only am I able to, to do that as well, but uh, if I have a button or uh, text that is potentially visible multiple times within the application, as we see here, the login, we see that login is going to be in multiple places, we can help our uh, neural network assign which login we should select by giving it the position and the index as far as what it's near or you know from the bottom from the top so that our neural network can overcome that so now we're going to do a search for the specific laptop again that we saw within uh, the uft1 test and we're going to do a search for that uh, but then it's going to show we're going to walk through an example of how we can uh, implement supervised learning within the codeless testing solution using the feedback tool. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, not only can I identify this by visual elements, but also by text. And uh, we can see that there's actually some objects that aren't identified. So we can see that at the bottom there, the quantity, the color, the details, it's not identifying those as objects that we can select. Uh, so we can use the feedback tool that automatically populates R&D's backlog with the information and the image that's provided 
by the direct feedback and be able to submit that back to the R&D backlog in order to better align and train the neural network going forward. So here we see marking the object for the details object and then giving a, a brief description of what is needed from, from a feedback standpoint so that eventually we can hopefully see that uh, released within the, the solution and the, the neural network so that we can add that in and that we can identify that specific object, in this case, the details button. So I have a existing script that we're gonna run now, even though we created one, uh, that already has preset environments. So one thing that we're gonna extend this to now is that we're gonna run this across our Android device, our iOS device, and mobile web as well on an Android device. So three completely separate platforms, one script, no code. And one thing that uh, I'll point out as we're running, as you see here, within the Android native app, the login button says login. And what we'll see within, once we launch the iOS device as well, is that the native iOS app for the login process is all, the login button is also going to say login, as we can see here. Now, I want you to pay attention once we launch the, the third device, which is running this same script on the web application. Whenever we go to log into the application, that button actually says sign in. Uh, so completely different from, from the two native apps, yet the, we were able to overcome that and continue with that because obviously you or I would have no problem with that. So we've been able to train, in this case, our neural network that, hey, you know, sign in and log in. In this context, we're, we're confident uh, based on that risk assessment from a unsupervised learning standpoint that we can select this and move forward with our test that this is the right process. And what you'll see here is that we're actually giving the ability to uh, give a confidence factor in the results so that, hey, AI will tell you this is the object I selected and this is why I selected it. So here's our new reality, right? We had our, uh, our, we had our existing reality where we had to write three different scripts and that introduced time to market challenges as well as high maintenance. Uh, so what we walked through today, which is our, our new reality uh, potentially is that we had, again, the use case of automating that process across those three different platforms uh, with our AI testing tool or codeless uh, equipped with out of the box computer vision and that human readable language utilizing that natural language processing capability. Uh, we were able to create one script for all three of those platforms, mobile web, Android native and iOS native. And then we were able to execute that using that built in AI model within the codeless solution. And obviously we're reducing that maintenance because of that AI model and we're making it more flexible and resilient as well. So really in three ways in that we're only creating one script, uh, the maintenance is going to be significantly lower because even when changes uh, occur to the object properties of the app, we don't care because we're re reading those in a human readable standpoint and then the flexibility as well. So even if I don't have the ability for my neural network, it's not trained enough yet to identify certain objects, I can still within the same script, whether within UFT1 or the codeless solution, use a properties-based identification method as well so that I can fall back to using things uh, you know, like the index and whatever that object property is within the same script. So I want to come back here to talk about uh, the, the challenges and how we can align to those challenges and overcome those challenges. So from a benefit standpoint, what we saw is that we can create uh, more reliable tests, uh, right? We can create once and let the automation intelligence overcome many of those frequent application releases and application changes that we're going to encounter, as well as we're able to eliminate that skill barrier because, again, using that NLP or natural language processing technology, we're able to create automation assets in readable plain language and without having to have any coding done at all whatsoever, not even behind the scenes. And then reduced maintenance. So obviously as uh, not only from the standpoint that within our example, we only had to create one script instead of three, but as our application changes, uh, that maintenance becomes significantly less because our 
neural network is able to overcome those changes to object properties because we're not using object properties in order to identify them or identify them as a human eye would. So with that, thank, thank you for, for letting us come and talk about some of the smarter testing capabilities that, that we're building into our functional testing portfolio. Uh, and now I'd like to, to open it up to any questions that you all may have. And uh, Ramesh, if there's any questions in the, the chat window as well, we can address those. So feel free to come yeah, off. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Mason. Uh, please let me know if anyone has any questions. You can unmute yourself and you know ask the question. Hi, Mason. Thanks for presenting. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a scientific study of neural linguistics within human babies, um, and I don't have the information with me, so it's not vetted. <laughs> but as babies, our brains, um, we are born with the ability to uh, make every sound that a human could make. But then as we learn from our parents and pair out the sounds that uh, are used only in our own native languages or the languages that our parents um, use, we forget how to make these other sounds. Right? And then as we age and become subject matter experts within the language, we can no longer make the sounds that we used to make as a baby, which were all of the human sounds. So somebody that speaks um, English, um, may not be able to make sounds that that uh, you know somebody from the APJ region would be able to make. And I just, I, I find that's an interesting um, kind of Yeah, absolutely. Sure finding the right yeah. word for it, but uh, <laughs> it to what to what this is what this is doing. Like it, it could know anything and everything um, and then as we pare down into subject matter experts, I mean, it, it very much mimics um, the way humans' uh, neural development takes place. So that's that's pretty cool. Wish I knew the name Absolutely. of that, that uh, neural linguistic scientist offhand. Yeah. But uh, he he did that by recording all of his child sounds, and then wow. Using uh, maybe some sort of spectral analyzer or oscilloscope, I forget which, um, notice that, yes, babies can make all of the human sounds. And then we unlearn how to make the ones that we don't need as we become subject matter experts in our given language. So Wow. Well, yeah, and I'm sure uh, throughout this presentation, you might have, I've heard him at least, you might have heard my my son making lots of those noises. And those sounds. <laughs> so now the the noise reduction is working great. So I didn't. Hear wonderful, it. wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Andy. Uh, so Mason, I do have a few more questions. Uh, when is the next release for UFT one? Great question. So that is targeted for August timeframe. Potentially could could uh, be pulled forward to July, but right now it's looking August timeframe for for the next release of UFT one. Okay, the follow-up question is, what version of UFT1 do I need to have to install for the EA capability? So the, the latest version of UFT1 is 15.0.1. The AI capabilities, I believe, were first introduced in either 14.5.2 or 14.5.3, but certainly significant leaps and bounds were made between, between the initial release of those things and, and where we're at today. So the the recommendation there would be to to be on UFT 15.0.1. Okay. So how can I run the test on multiple devices? So within uh, I'm going to answer that in two different ways. So the example that I showed with within UFT 1 is UFT 1 starting in uh, again I can't quite remember the exact version it started and we'll just we're, we'll I'll talk about an answer with the, the latest version. And so 15.0.1, you have the ability to have a one-to-one -one device pairing with your instance of UFT1. So I have my laptop here in front of me where UFT is installed. I could via USB or a, uh, a emulated device on, on that laptop as well. 
I could connect that and have the ability to, to have the view of what I showed you within UFT1 in that video. Now for the codeless application, uh, that still requires the use and connection to UFT Mobile, which is our digital lab for connecting mobile devices and managing mobile devices and applications and connecting those to different peripheral testing solutions. So codeless being one of those, UFT being one of those. Um, so that would be the answer. With UFT1, you can connect a local device or use UFT Mobile with a codeless testing solution. It would be connecting to UFT Mobile to have those devices. Thank you. So uh, the question, next question is, uh, what cloud platform are supported? I assume like it will support everything, right? Azure, AWS, and... Uh, Sorry, it was a little a little muffled. Could you ask that one again? The question is like, no, what cloud platform are supported? Cloud platform. What, what platform. cloud platforms? Uh, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in what capacity? Is there, is there any more? Uh, Whoever asked that question want to elaborate? Peter, do you want to elaborate the question? So I'll, I'll take a stab at answering that. So when it comes to UFT1, uh, UFT1 is a, a client application. So certainly you could install it in any cloud, given that the minimum you know, system requirements and the uh, the recommendations for or the you know the support capability, the the matrix for what operating system and versions are supported, as long as those things are met, then you know any cloud provider, Azure, AWS, uh, again, as long as those system requirements were met. Um, so yeah, there's. Uh, there's not really a, a restriction of which cl cloud provider as long as there's a supported environment. Um, but again, it is it is a client application. So in order to interact with that, uh, you would have the, the same restrictions as you would by accessing any other client application. But certainly it could be on a, a, a host that is um, on a VM or in the cloud. Hope that answers that. <laughs> So thank you, everyone. Uh, do you, anyone have any questions? Any more questions? So with that, I'd like to switch to the last few slides. Uh, Mason. Yep. And and please know as well that my my email address will be sent out after this, as well as a copy of the presentation. So if there are any more questions that arise uh, as we as we leave here today, then please feel free to to send them to myself, uh, you know, with my email address, and I'm I'm happy to to take those questions. Thanks, Ramesh. Thanks, Mason. So thanks for everyone to join the uh, session today. Uh, there are many podcasts available on the Webit website, uh, so please join as a Webit member if you are not a member currently and get access to those uh, podcasts and recordings. And the last, uh, the, this event was, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like it's been recorded. Uh, the link will be uh, sent to you via email um, in, in within the next few days, as well as the survey asking for your feedback. Uh, so please feel free to provide the feedback with all the information. So we should expect the next meeting would be like, you know, in person, hopefully things back to normal. Uh, watch for your uh, Grubhub code that will be emailed to you, uh, the email address which you've given for registration uh, in a day or two. Thanks again for joining. Thanks, Mission, for, for the demo. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for joining today. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.